Hello, welcome. We're going to get started in just a couple minutes here. I'm just going to leave a few minutes for folks to, to tune in. Uh, go ahead and if you're joining us, drop in the chat where you are tuning in from. We love to see where everyone is joining us from. So feel free to say hi in the chat and let us know where you're from. Ooh, Tracy is from Perth, Australia. Hi, Tracy. Welcome. Wonderful. Just going to give it another moment here to let folks come on in. Sherry is from Barossa Valley, Australia. I hope I'm saying that right. Jane is joining us from Minnesota. Hi from Maplewood, New Jersey. Hi, Jessica. Got Chicago, San Diego, Houston, New Zealand. Wonderful. Love seeing folks tuning in from all over. Fantastic. Hi from San Francisco. Beautiful. Hi from Seattle. Oh, hi, Erin. Marla is tuning in from just north of Seattle and Shoreline. Fantastic. Okay, well that has even off a bit. I think we're gonna go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining us today, everyone. We are here to discuss My Darling Lemon Time every day. I've got the book right here. Oh, it's upside down, sorry. <laughs> have a little bit of trouble showing you with my green screen, um, but we're so excited to have Emma Galloway here to talk to us about her new book, along with Amy Chaplin, two fantastic authors. We're very excited to chat with both of them. Um, let me get, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm Zoe Friesen. I'm the events manager here at Book Larder. Book Larder is a cookbook store, a community cookbook store located in Seattle, Washington. We have all cookbooks and food writing. Um, and we, we've been uh, doing, of course, a lot of virtual events over the last couple of years, as you can well imagine. And we are starting to do some in-person events as well, which is always such a delight. Uh, we just had Aaron in store actually the other day for a fantastic event. Um, but we are so happy to be able to continue to offer virtual events as well, uh, which allow us to connect with folks from all over the world. Um, you know, especially events like today where Emma's in a different continent and Amy's on another coast and we're here in Seattle. Um, and you are able to tune in from all over. So we absolutely love being able to offer that and we uh, plan to continue these, you know, well into the future. Let's see. Um, Okay, this talk will be recorded and posted on YouTube. So the recording will be up within a couple of days. Uh, so if you wanna share that with your friends or if you have to run and you miss the end, you can always tune back in and see what was discussed. Um, and that's always a fun way to catch that. Uh, I do have the live transcript turned on. You can turn that on or off at the bottom of your screen. There is a live transcript button. So if you want that on or you want it off, you can, you can take care of that. You can go ahead and do that. Um, go ahead and use the chat to chat with each other or to ask me questions or anything like that. Um, if you want to ask questions for, if you have questions for Emma and Amy, please drop those in the Q and A box at the bottom of your screen. So feel free to use the chat just for chatting, but for questions, go ahead and drop those in that Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And um, towards the end of the hour, I will pop back on and we will be taking, uh, Emma and Amy will be taking some of your questions that were dropped into the Q&A box. So make sure you put your questions there. Um, you can support the talk by ordering a copy of the book from our shop. And thank you so much to everyone that has done that already. Um, I will let you know we are back ordered on the book right now. Um, so we do have some wonderful signed book plates that Emma sent us. So once the book is back in stock, we will be able to get you that uh, book plate signed copy. So feel free to go ahead and order those signed copies and we'll get those out to you just as soon as we can. And thank you for all your patience and understanding with that. Um, okay, now without further ado, let's welcome Emma and Amy. Hey there. Hi. Hi. <laughs> oh, I'm so excited to be doing this with you, Emma. Congratulations on your beautiful new book for those people that haven't seen it. I don't know if that's showing up right or if it's yeah. all jumbled. Um, 
Yeah, this is a beautiful new book of Emma's. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to talk to you. So thank you, um, Zoe and Book Lada for having us and for having me back. I had such a great experience at Book Lado when I was touring my second book. And it was one of the best interviews I've had with Ara and Goyoga. And I was trying to remember one question she asked me and I can't. So I've just been <laughs> diving into like your book and taking a walk around my garden, trying to think about, you know, what are the main things I want to know about your whole process and, and your books? Because you've got three. So this is your third one. Um, and I thought maybe we could start with you talking to people that may not know you um, a little bit about what you do. And then I'd love to hear all about, you know, the motivation behind this book. Sure. Thanks, Amy. Um, thank you for being here as well. <laughs> it's a little bit of a treat text for us to be able to speak to each other face to face after years of kind of communicating backwards and forwards online. Uh, so yeah, my name's Emma Galloway. I am from a very small little town in New Zealand called Raglan. Um, I grew up um, in a very similar manner to Amy as well, um, with parents that grew a lot of our own food. Uh, my mum cooked pretty much everything we ate from scratch. And so food has always been a massive part of my life. Uh, I went on to train as a chef after leaving high school and worked in the industry for probably about eight years before I had um, my two kids. And it was when my actually it was when I was pregnant with my daughter that I started reacting to foods. And it wasn't until quite a bit later when she was probably about one, I think, that we realized um, through different testing and seeing different people that I actually react quite badly to gluten. And at times, including right now, um, don't do so well with dairy as well. So my diet went from being vegetarian, which was already kind of, you know, restricting in a way, to being vegetarian, gluten-free and dairy-free. And I felt like even with my chef background, I struggled at the start. So I decided with the encouragement of a couple of my friends, hi Jana, I think she's on here, um, that I would start a blog after reading, actually it was Jenna who told me about um, Heidi Swanson's book and then I got her book from our local library and on the back she had her blog on there and we're talking like 12 years ago, blogs were not a, a thing really back then so it kind of blew my mind that, that there were people online as obsessed with food as me and so I decided to start my own food blog and that is where the name My Darling Lemon Time um, comes from because that's the name of my blog and yeah I guess it just started from there. Years of writing a blog uh, led to writing my books. Yeah, that's great. I um, mm. I did. I wanted to say actually that some people may not realize that. Um, yeah, we we've actually never spoken until a few days ago. <laughs> and yeah, it might seem like we could be friends because we've got sort of a similar, a <laughs> lot of similarities. It's actually amazing. When I was reading your, the introduction to your first book, I was like, I have sort of had to double read it because I was like, hang on a second, <laughs> sounds like me. It was just so <laughs> funny. And then there's all these other things that have come up throughout your, all your books um, that, you know, just a lot of similarities. And I especially think your approach to food and, and how you eat daily, like, you know, we can all get excited about, you know, creating really creative different recipes, but I feel like, like you just respond to things like steamed <laughs> silver beet and or chart <laughs> since we're in America here um so so those are the kind of things I absolutely love eating is a really simple healing food like 90 percent of the time and it's kind of like yeah writing a recipe about that is hard and I just wanted to ask you about how you kind of I, I feel like you bought it into this book really well like it's everyday food and it's still beautiful it's still nourishing it's still delicious it's all the things that I, I, I look for. And it's really nice just seeing like, you know, how you explore that. And so is that really what you started with, with this book or did it morph into that? Yeah, no, it definitely started with that. I mean, th this is, this is how I cook. This is exactly how I cook. Um, 
I mean, probably a little bit more adventurous than how I cook on a day-to-day basis. Some of the things, because I do tend to stick to pretty simple, but yeah, it's funny being in the food blogging world and even like, you know, sharing food on Instagram and stuff. It's really easy to get caught up in the kind of feeling like you have to keep up with the Joneses in a way. Um, and almost like you can't share just really simple things it has to be something new it has to be something really exciting and I find that the average person is not really interested in that they just like talking to my girlfriends uh, there's a couple of them that just really aren't confident cooks and they just want to know the basics and they want to be inspired to actually get in the kitchen and, and look at a recipe that they feel they could achieve um so I feel like with all my recipes, with all the recipes I've ever created, I've always kind of tried to keep it achievable and um, definitely affordable because as you'll know in the, in the kind of the food genre that, that we're both in, health food, you know, can be really expensive. It can be really uh, just not attainable for the average person so I did going into writing this book I definitely wanted to keep it really simple I wanted it to be everyday food that you know like people will see a recipe and they may have all the ingredients already in their pantry or their you know between their pantry their garden and their um and their fridge they might have all the ingredients or if they don't they I'm I offer variations so that they can you know they can swap out different fruits or vegetables or herbs but keep the base recipe the same um so yeah definitely that was my plan going in but I mean I don't know how you approach books for me it's a really like I have an idea I can kind of loosely nut it out but it definitely evolves as I'm going on um through it and as as we all know uh, 2020 was was quite a big one for the world and that was when I was actually writing this book so it did actually it took my my idea of trying to convey simple everyday achievable food it took that idea and it actually made it a reality for me while I was creating the book because we were in very strict lockdown during a portion of when I was writing this book and we could only go to the supermarket every couple of weeks and we were really relying on what we actually you know just had at home so this book uh yeah it was it was created during those times so it actually really pushed me to consider every single ingredient that I put into every single recipe and question whether or not it was necessary you know um I I purposely shot a lot of the book like kind of un- ungarnished, I guess, you know, the, the word would be in that, you know, normally when you're styling a book, you're trying to make it look as nice as possible, but that's actually not how I would serve it. If I was serving it to my family at home, I would just, you know, save a bowl of soup. I would serve a bowl of soup. I wouldn't necessarily have five different toppings on the top. I mean, sometimes I do if they add something to it, but Mm -hmm. as a general rule, we serve food just really simply. And so I wanted to actually convey that in my, in my photos as much as the recipes, because I didn't want people to think that they had to go out and either, you know, harvest or buy um, a specific herb just to put on the top of something, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, there's a lot there. Um, (laughs) No, I really, no, but good stuff. Like, I really appreciate that you did that, like actually lived through it and really did simplify it. And because I often say, I mean, just about soups, that's an interesting point because I feel like, oh, I remember in my first book, I did a very simple soup and I just thought like, what else do you need? Nothing. Yeah. But then I was seeing like all these soups with all these creative toppings and I was thinking, oh yeah, but then sometimes it doesn't actually make sense. You know, like it looks beautiful, but those herbs kind of wilt and get tangled in a creamy soup. You know what I mean? (laughs) So it's just interesting. Like, yeah, just really act like everything is very real. Cause I feel like a lot of what we see in food media is just like so beautiful and so like, It's almost over the top, I guess. And so I really love that you've sort of pared it down, especially at a time when you actually, it just doesn't make sense to be 
or not even possible to use things from all over the world too. So I really love that sustainable approach as well, like that it's affordable, but also sustainable. Like, you, yeah, you're using some curry leaves that may, I mean, they probably grow in New Zealand, but mm -hmm. a lot of places they don't grow where they are and they're, but then you talk about freezing them and how they, and I thought, great, yeah, I've got some in the freezer. And then you can use them in like three different ways in your book. So, so I think that's really, really useful rather it, it, useful in a way that sort of incorporates everything. Like I love also that you talk about low waste in there. There's a whole section about it. And so it does feel very real. So I think that you've really achieved that. And I hope those girlfriends are <laughs> satisfied. <laughs> the ones <laughs> that can't cook you know do you get that <laughs> feedback about this book like like have you gotten like oh yeah great now I am making meals on a daily basis yeah well it, it I mean it, it always blows me away when I see people sharing you know making my food and then sharing it you know on Instagram or whatever and tagging me in it but it's quite amazing there's this one woman in particular I wish I knew her name off the top of my head I feel like it's Kate but I might have that wrong. I swear she has cooked nearly every single recipe in this book wow. and shared it on her Instagram. And that just blows me away, like totally blows me away because I mean, I have, I own, I don't know, I've lost count of how many cookbooks I own. There's probably like a good three or 400 or like there's a lot. I own a lot of cookbooks. And for me, I get a lot of inspiration from them, but I actually general, in general terms, I don't cook from them. Like I don't tend to cook from cookbooks myself. Um, so to see someone actually get a cookbook and use it to that extent where they, they're making every single recipe is amazing. Yeah. It's a huge compliment. I mean, you yeah. can't ask for anything better. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Like and I, I, I've always, whenever I've written my books, I've always gone into it with the thinking that I want to create a book that people cook from. You know, like I really want them to cook from it. I want them to use it. I want them to get their money's worth. I want them to incorporate it into their life. Yeah. 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 So, so on that note about inspiration, do you, how, what do you feel like is your main source of inspiration? First, just for recipes, not visually, but just like recipes. Probably my garden, I think. <laughs> yeah. Um, we are lucky enough to have a pretty big garden and um, just, yeah, cook it, cooking with the seasons comes naturally when you have a garden. And so, you know, for instance, right now it's the start of spring and we have like so many greens. It's not funny. There is, <laughs> I wish you were here to, to yeah. eat some steam chard with me. <laughs> we have like so much kale and what we call silver beet, but you would call chard in the U.S., with so much of it and so that inspires me to then go okay so what can I do with it nine times out of ten and, it, and we spoke about this the other day when we talked but nine times out of ten I, I just prepare it really simply and I was totally inspired when I saw your recent trip to Australia and you were picking chard from your dad's garden and you said that you were just going to steam it and have it with a bit of tamari over the top of it like that's that's often how how I would eat it or just quickly sauteed in a bit of like ghee and, and salt and pepper. And that's, that's mm. actually it. Yeah. But um, extending out from that, I get, I mean, ov obviously I get a whole lot of inspiration from my fellow uh, cookbook authors and food creators. So, um, you know, so on social media or on Pinterest, I get a lot of inspiration and from my, my hundreds of cookbooks as well. Um, and it could just be like the tiniest little, like a combination of, of, herbs that's in that that I then go oh my god that's a great idea that I then can take and and add to a completely different dish you know or a you know an idea for a dressing or a, just the usually the the pairings like the flavor combinations is what I get inspired by yeah yeah, yeah. I was also thinking just from your books and the influences of your travels and obviously you yeah traveling lately but do you feel like, do you go back to markets or meals that you had from a street vendor or when you were traveling more? Or Absolutely. Like, yeah. 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 So my, I don't, I don't know how you would totally explain my style. I'm not so good at talking about my own work, but um, 
there's a definite like Southeast Asian and like Indian influence to all my food. I have always um, like we've always used a lot of spice in our meals and uh, my husband's Vietnamese. So, and I've spent a lot of time over the years with his mother and like peeping over her shoulder as she cooks her amazing food. So I've definitely picked up those influences and yeah, all of my travels have been through Southeast Asia, India, Sri Lanka. Um, so that's the kind of food that I, I absolutely love. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, and what I was thinking also, like we were talking about this simple nourishing food that I feel like really comes through in your book in a way that's not like too simple that you're like, oh, you know, I could do that or I already do that. I actually feel like we're often as cookbook authors, like a little afraid to go too simple because it's like <laughs> everyone knows how to do that, you know, and yeah. you kind of think, ah. Oh, you know, so you sort of try to add like something that you can add on top, but it may not be how you eat it. Just, just like if you serve it to someone that isn't your immediate family, maybe you would add it, you know. But I feel like, um, yeah, you've done a really great job of that in this book. And I just wondered, you know, like, <laughs> oh, sorry, I'm sorry, I've just sort of lost my train of thought. I was just like really <laughs> in your recipe for steamed veggies and things. Um, <laughs> Oh yeah, no, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Back to, yeah, your inspiration. So yeah, so really simple food. And then when it comes to visually uh, and your photographs, because I don't know if everyone knows this, but Emma photographs and styles everything. So it's not just writing a book and then hiring and working with photographers and food stars and sometimes prop stylists. You actually do all of that. So you're also the creative director of the book, which is, I know what that's like and it's so much work but thinking about light and everything. So, so when it comes to photography, like how do you get inspiration for the way you want it to look? Like it sounds like in this last book, you just wanted it to be very real how you put it on the table. But do you, um, do you think it through before you snap the photo? Like, oh, this bowl would be really beautiful for this. Or is it just like, I'm just gonna do that today and whatever bowl takes your fancy, you just try it. Uh... A little bit of both, I think. I It's funny, when I first started my blog and, you know, was teaching myself how to take photos and I my kids were really young back then and I literally, the only time that, you know, like the, I didn't have time to really style anything, which is how I, how my very simple kind of simplistic styling came about was just because I simply didn't have time to to put into to adding heaps of props and stuff. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think I'm probably known for my top top down shots of lots of different bowls um, because I love ceramics and lots of beautiful bowls. So yeah, it definitely, my style has always been fast <laughs> yeah. and not always well thought out, I have to say. But in saying that with this book, so while I was working on this book in the probably two or three years before that, I actually was working for a, one of the, well, the main food magazine in New Zealand. I had a column in there that I wrote um, five recipes for each issue styled and took the photos for. And that really stretched, stretched me like as a photographer and stylist um, big time because I had an art director with a very strict idea of what she kind of wanted, which was kind of polar opposite to my natural style. So I learned so much during those, I think it was about three and a half years I worked there. And so I was writing this book while still working for them. And I feel like that really did influence the photos in this and that um, it, while I've still got my simple style, there's definitely more stuff in it. You know, like I did, I did pause and I thought, thought it through a little bit more, I think, than I have in previous books. Yeah. Yeah. Because of the feedback, like when you're doing a magazine, it is so different than yeah and like yeah and I just before. because yeah. I was had been doing like that was my that had been my life for three and a half years at that stage I just it came became a bit more natural I definitely overthought it a little more than I did in previous books where I'm like oh nice concrete garage floor yep plonk something down quick take a photo and it's done I yeah I definitely thought about it a bit more I think with this yeah but. and so did your kids help you now now that they're not like trying to grab the food off the set like I can I can't imagine actually trying to do a book with a young child like yours were in the first well thankfully my son I think my son just started kindergarten 
uh, as I started working on my first book. So it was kind of perfect timing. And then I had, like, I would cook like crazy while my kids were at school. My daughter's two years older than him. Um, and then I would edit photos and write up the recipes at night once they were in bed. So, wow. yeah. Still, still, still <laughs> I mean, it's so life. much work. It is so, like, I'm not going to lie. It, it, yeah. Every book has just about killed me physically um, doing it all by myself. But I can't imagine... I can't imagine doing it any other way. Yeah. Do you just swear, like, I'm never going to do another book when you're in the trenches of, like, and you can't. Absolutely. Again. Yeah. But then but then when it's over, it's like, oh, put the rose-coloured glasses back on. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a little bit like having kids, isn't it? <laughs> I actually want to ask you about um, the kids. Like, were they, because I feel like, you know, you're, you're, recipes are not even though they might be simple they're definitely not bland at all mm. I mean even I love bland things like just simple but there's I guess there's a difference but I feel like you add chili and they're eating I feel like there's pictures of them eating some stuff that uh, you know my son definitely wouldn't eat and not because he's any uh, he just likes plain very plain things more plain than me like pasta without anything bread without butter that kind of thing so it I just wonder like my son they, Right. So they weren't always adventurous or just sort of eating what you're cooking. Like now, do they, do they all eat, you all eat together or do you feel like you leave out the really hot sauce or whatever and keep it on the side for them? Um, I mean, my two kids are polar opposites in the way that they eat. My daughter pretty much, she was like my little sidekick I remember when I wrote my first book, like she would eat everything that I, that I made, like every single thing. Whereas my husband's quite picky and my son's really picky. So it was just me and my daughter eating most of the food that I created. Um, she, now she's like the most amazing cook. She watches things on TikTok and, and makes all these amazing Korean dishes that I'm not even familiar with. Um, so yeah. she has an amazing palate and very critical of like both my kids are like little food critics which is great but sometimes I'm like can we just eat the dinner without the critiquing <laughs> um but they've yeah so they've I mean but they've grown up you know around this uh so yeah my daughter eats everything she for I mean I remember when I was pregnant with my son so there's 22 months between my two kids and it was literally just before I went into labor I think and I had made a really, really hot like Thai curry. And my daughter at nearly two was eating that. Like she oh. just, but I think, you know, like I, I don't think it was anything I did. I think it's just who she is because my son is the opposite. And he's the still now at 14 would just wants plain pasta, bread with no, exactly bread with no butter. <laughs> no, it's um, weird. It's definitely really, weird. really <laughs> simple. He'll eat, you know, like raw vegetables, but he won't eat cooked ones. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's a thing. Yeah. I think it's a thing with some kids because I remember people saying, oh, picky eater, I've got a picky eater. And I thought, well, that's probably because he hasn't been offered olives and mm. or just spicy things or something. But like they call anything with flavours spicy to him, you know? Like, yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. I'm often like, so let me put something on that. But no, just no. Dry, yeah, dry, plain, like the whole loaf, just eating it. So I yeah. don't know. Yeah. yeah, I think I do. I mean, I think, well, you know, there's a certain amount of influence that you can give. I think, you know, people know what they like and what they don't like in yeah. general. Yeah. yeah. And whether or not that, that might change, you know, I, I used to hate eating capsicum when I was little and mushrooms couldn't stand either of them. And now I like them as an adult. So our taste yeah. did change as well. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> um, so, so what, so speaking of like that kind of simple food that we both connect over and love um, that you've, I feel like those kind of things like steamed, Swiss chard or silver beet or like like just make you feel better if you've got like a sore throat or a sore mouth or something from eating like different flavored foods like when I travel all I want is like steamed greens at the end but um do you um like what do you make when you don't feel well <laughs> like when you feel run down like what's your go-to dish and is there anything in this book that is like mm. something like that like you know people have chicken soup I have miso yeah. soup as well as another one for me but I was curious I mean yeah. my mum's vegetable soup which I kind of I think I've, I've got it in here but I did it um I did a like a no recipe recipe because I this was especially for my two of my girlfriends who both in the same week wrote to me asking for pumpkin soup recipe and I was just like 
you don't need a recipe for pumpkin soup. You don't need a recipe for most soups. Like you, you can really just wing soups, a lot of them, you know, some yeah. you want them, but um, so I put just the breakdown of how, how my mum makes her vegetable soup um, in this book. And I think that's probably one of the most comforting things to me. And literally it's just all the vegetables in a pot chopped up small um there's a few things that she does that i think really make a difference she grates the pumpkin oh, um puts greens one. in just right at the end uh seasons it with tamari or soy sauce which is such a 80s hippie, hippie, <laughs> hippie style <laughs> flavoring um if you've got a bit of dried kelp add that into which we grew up um eating Yes, I, it probably soup for me, actually, which is funny because I'm not a huge soup person. But if I'm thinking back to like my childhood and, and what comforts me, it would, yeah, it would probably be my mum's vegetable soup. Yeah, that's mm. a really interesting tip about great. Is that in the book? Do you grate the, the pumpkin, yeah. the squash? Yeah. Anyone in America that doesn't, it's like it's yeah, squash. pumpkin that we carve for Halloween. It is winter squash, which is dense and delicious and sweet, like red curry or kabocha. I don't know if you have yep. names in New Zealand but yeah so she grates it so that it dissolves and kind of thickens the well it kind of it, it doesn't re it doesn't completely dissolve so it, it, you can fun. still see the flecks in there but it just it's not it's a total different texture so if you're biting like a little cube of pumpkin mm. it's still yeah I can't explain it but it, to me it feels like that's what adds the magic to her, to her yeah. um, vegetable soup and and also finally little tiny cubes of potato is always like I remember when we were growing up, which is weird because I'm sure we had heaps of potatoes around, but it was always like finding the little bits of gold amongst the <laughs> amongst the vegetable soup and they were the little chunks of potato. So I don't and know. Can I ask you about, does she then like season it with tamari? So basically the flavor is coming from all the vegetables because sometimes yeah. when you're growing your own food, this is the thing, isn't it? It's like, it tastes so amazing or buying it from, you know, the farmer's market fresh or CSA or whatever you've got um then the the broth is just so sweet you don't and just tasty you don't really need to add miso like sometimes I plan to and then I'm like actually mm. just needs a bit more salt or a tamari or something yeah is that your sort of um do you have anything up your sleeve that you might do to like do you add herbs or when you when you're like mm, you know sometimes just lacking like maybe the vegetables are not super fresh or you have you're not you don't have a garden so yeah. it's like sometimes I feel like people make something and then it's because it's not the best peach <laughs> to blend into something. It's like not as sweet, right? So then it's not mm. as flavorful. And people sometimes are like, oh yeah, it was okay. And I think, well, you really got to know how to pick things. But say you are shopping in just a regular supermarket, do you find you get still good results from that recipe? Or do you feel like, well, you might need a bit of miso or some bay leaves or yeah I, I mean it depends on what you're making but like pumpkin is the perfect example if you're making a I mean well squash in America if you are making a soup out of that and the actual pumpkin mm. or squash initially isn't like a really beautiful rich like it hasn't been you know it, it's just not a really flavorsome pumpkin you're not it's you while you can still get a really nice soup at the end of it you will have to do lots to actually make it tasty like um, yeah, definitely my go-tos. I mean, so, salt, <laughs> definitely. Um, tamari. Is it sea salt for you? What's your yeah. favorite? Like, and yeah, you, I just use the sea salt. Celtic sea salt, or what is? What do you get in New Zealand? Is it local salt? Uh, I just get New Zealand sea salt. I don't know. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. cool. yeah. yeah. I'm sure it's, it's a, clean water. There's a couple of companies here now that that um that harvest salt, which is really cool. That's amazing. Yeah. Great. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah sea salt. Um, and soups a little bit like especially with the vegetable soup I will always add the celery leaves to the soup because they have just so much flavor so much flavor and it's such a waste to just chuck them out and what I've actually got into in the last couple of years is when our because we grow our own celery it's never enough to do heaps with but I've always got like kind of maybe six or seven plants um at the end of the season when it's all kind of threatening to go to seed what I'll do is I just chop off all the leaves and dehydrate them and then just crush mm -hmm. them up so that I've always got this beautiful dried celery leaves which just add so much flavor to soups or a little sprinkle on like fried rice um mm -hmm. fried eggs you know like 
so much flavor in these little leaves and so that's a good one um or mix it with some sea salt really, and then you've got yeah. celery salt which is um, what people which i never understood the attraction to it because it's always awful mm, when you buy it in some you know yeah. it's like, like no one's done a gourmet one yet that i've seen i but feel like um yourself? bought celery salt often too is i think they use the seeds is it celery seeds that they use oh i don't know which have oh, a, i yeah, think really. it i I don't know. I feel like it is. And then it's like, a, it's a it's harsher different. kind of celery taste. taste. Yeah. yeah. Real different. Yeah. Oh my God. That's so interesting. Mm. I love that idea of drying them and crushing them up. That's such yeah. A I think I can't remember if I, I'd have to look through. I feel like I added that in this book, but it was kind of right around then that I kind of started doing it. And if I, yeah. if I didn't, if it didn't make it into the book, it was not long after that I started doing it, but I think it is. I think it's in the, um, the like food waste section of this book yeah right um yeah so do you I do, do a lot of dehydrating in I've got into it more well since I got a dehydrator um <laughs> yeah I <laughs> it's such a great way when you have a garden to preserve things you know without having to um rely on a freezer or whatever so I do the same thing with kale too now at the end of the season when it's all you know needs using up before it goes to seed I do the same so I just strip the strip the leaves off the stalks dehydrate them and then just kind of crush them all up to this beautiful powder which again you can just add to everything and you don't because it's so small great way to sneak vegetables into kids because you you know you add that to a soup or a stir fry or whatever and you don't even really notice it you don't taste yeah. it so you mm. just dehydrate it dry not like a chip and then you just no. Yeah, oh, just completely great, nothing, yeah. nothing on it. Yeah, I just, I think I just started doing that last, um, about this time last year, I think I did that for the first time and it's been amazing. Yeah. That's such a good idea. Um, yeah. What is something unexpected that we might find in your fridge or pantry? You can answer both. I feel like I've gotten to know the pantry a little bit just then. I feel like there's a there's a lot of stuff going on in my pantry <laughs> my younger brother comes over here and he's like a, he's really into food and he's an amazing cook as well and he just comes over here and he's just like because there's I'm one of those people that gets really sucked into buying like really random things like black garlic or um a different spice mix or something or a herb tea and and yeah so I have I have lots of things like that in my pantry um I don't know if there's anything overly surprising my pantry I mean my fridge is completely full of jars of stuff like kimchi sauerkraut all all the different flowers that I keep in the fridge because I grind a lot of my own flowers and so I keep them in the fridge just to keep them fresher um do you grind um like the like a brown rice can you get it fine enough like a brown rice nah. flour? you buy that nah. but like what, yeah. what what's a flour that you would grind that people wouldn't and what do you grind with that people um so I just mine? use the I, i've got a vitamix so i use the vitamix to grind um quinoa flour can a uh, buckwheat's probably the main one that i do it, like literally takes 40 seconds to grind it to a flour yeah. um, and i just do it in kind of like what would that be like a litre kind of jar at a time um and quinoa you can also do millet um you can but blend quinoa, up really easily do you find quinoa is a bit better if you or do you wash and dry it and then grind it or do you buy it washed no, i buy the what well the stuff that i will grind for flour i buy the pre washed. the pre-washed stuff yeah so we um all the imported stuff to new zealand to my knowledge is already pre-washed Oh. Um, so I can get an organic one of that and that's what I'll use for flour but there's actually there's two families in New Zealand now which is like it's like a big thing <laughs> for, our, for our little country there's two families here now growing quinoa wow. which is amazing and one of them I'm actually I found out I'm related to and quite closely related to oh. um, <laughs> which is really cool down yeah. with my um where my granddad grew up uh, and that one is like a whole grain one that does need washing. So I, I wouldn't grind that one into a flour. It would be way too bitter. Yeah. I just right. cook that one. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. So you keep them in your fridge because you do a large amount and then it stays fresher and you, you know, you've got a decent container in there. 
Yeah, I mean, I go through buckwheat flour. That's probably the buckwheat flour and brown rice flour are the ones that I use the most of. So I turn through it pretty fast, the buckwheat one. Yeah, yeah. but yeah, I mean, I don't know, maybe maybe it's being overly cautious, but I feel like I feel just safer knowing that it is in the fridge because buckwheat in particular, I don't know about quinoa, but buckwheat can go quite rancid, quite, mm. you know, and just doesn't taste so nice. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's so yeah. much nicer than buying it because... It, changed, it varies so much. I don't know about in New Zealand, but here it's like really dark or it's really light. I had some in Australia from New Zealand that was so light. I couldn't believe mm. it was buckwheat. It was like delicious. That's, like the that's actually pancakes. something I think, um, I think I've seen in Aaron's books actually. Yeah, um, it does talk about that. Yeah, because I it's so hard to write a book for a world audience mm. when you know when you're in one country because the buckwheat that we get here is beautiful like it, it is, is so, it is gorgeous. it's light <laughs> I have a feeling a lot of the buckwheat you guys get in the U.S. is toasted first isn't it or not well, it doesn't taste it like it's got no uh. taste but you do you can get it's called kasha when it's toasted mm. buckwheat but it's just a different type like it's almost bluey in color bob's red milk really dark eh? it's dark I don't know if you yeah. get that, no. I don't know if you it, but they import it in Australia too. But the stuff from New Zealand, I mean, it's fluffy. It's just a whole other thing. Yeah. I just wonder if the actual buckwheat is different too. Because if I, the buckwheat we get is pretty light. And I don't know if anyone yeah. wants to know about these details. But, <laughs> but speaking of gluten-free, do you feel like you were allergic, you know, a long time ago, like it was quite a while, I guess. Um, and then you, you know, all your books are gluten free, which is great for people that um, are gluten free and vegetarian and a lot of dairy free too. But do you feel like you might experiment with some gluten or have you? And just you might incorporate it in another book if, if you're not allergic? Uh, probably not. Yeah. Um, I kind of go backwards and forwards with dairy depending on how my system feels. Um, but to be honest, I don't miss really anything that has gluten in it. I've been eating this way for, gosh, my daughter's 16 now, so a long time. And I mean, maybe something really gross, like a donut or something, <laughs> like a cream donut. Um, I was thinking nice. like some artisanal sourdough because everyone's so Yeah, no, I'm thinking if so I'm... Good. <laughs> I'm thinking if I'm gonna eat gluten, I'm gonna go for the like <laughs> the, the junk. <laughs> Just so you know, why not? Um, but no, there's no, I haven't I haven't thought to try it um in quite a number of years. Um and yeah, I mean who knows? Never say never. And one day hopefully I can get on top of my my gut issues and I won't be reacting to food in the way that I am. Um, because I, I'm not celiac, so it's just oh, a, right. it's just a, um, Intolerant. hopefully something that I could cure at some stage. I've been trying right. for many years. Um, yeah, so we'll see. Yeah, but well, like I said, I don't miss it. Right. Yeah. No. Yeah, yeah. That's true. I mean, once you're just you know in your groove, and if you can eat at home, then it's like yeah. you know, it's so much easier than when you're like moving around. But yeah. also, like you also state somewhere that you don't love pasta. And I was like, oh, yeah, actually, I noticed that you don't. I mean, I didn't notice. But now that you say that, I was like, yeah, there's not a lot of pasta recipes, like gluten-free no. or not, because now there's so many amazing gluten-free pastas you can buy. I was the, you know, but yeah, you just, just not something you're drawn to. It is more rice and grains and. Yeah. So, I mean, we grew up just eating brown rice, brown rice and lots of beans and, um, it's just, I mean, we ate a little bit of pasta, but it just, I don't know, it, it, it's funny because I was never a huge, like, cheese fan either, which is lucky because, you know, for a long time I couldn't eat any cheese. And also, you know, when we first switched to gluten-free, the, the pasta on offer was disgusting. You know, you'd cook it and it would just turn into this big glob in the mm. bottom of the pan <laughs> um so it was lucky that I didn't really love it and and miss it yeah because that would be really hard if your diet consisted naturally of a lot of you know pasta and cheese yeah uh, yeah, yeah no rice is my go-to like we um we eat rice like I'll cook rice nearly every day um and if we don't eat it for dinner I'll make sure that I cook extra and have a you know for breakfast or lunch or we eat a, we eat a lot of rice in this house 
Wait, yeah. it looks like there might be some questions. I was just like, hang on, did I get to everything? But yeah, <laughs> go ahead. I would love, that's good, if there's good questions. <laughs> yes, absolutely. We're loving the conversation. Actually, Erin um, Goyaga is on the line and she uh -oh. had also put a comment. She <laughs> says, in the US, they add more hull to the buckwheat flour, which makes it darker. In other countries, they dehull the groats and grind those so it's lighter. Thank ah, you. There you go. always got the Thank answers. Um, <laughs> and, and Aaron had actually uh, put some questions in the Q&A as well, so I will start with those. Um, she writes, I have a question about eggs. I am gluten and dairy free, but I do eat animal protein. More and more I hear from people about avoiding eggs and baking as more and more people are turning vegan. As someone who bakes gluten-free, I'm leaning towards more plant-based baking, but eggs are important in gluten-free baking. How do you feel about eggs? Mm, interesting timing of that question, actually, because after the last year or so, I've been eating quite a strict FODMAP diet. Um, after mm. I finished working on this book, my body actually re started reacting to more things than ever before. And I went on a low FODMAP diet and the only kind of vegetarian protein that I could eat was eggs. So my oh, wow. egg intake went through the roof for the first time in years. And I've actually just, uh, I'm, I haven't fully accepted it yet, but I think actually eggs probably aren't that great for me. Mm. Um, I don't want to completely cut them out, but I've definitely toned down the amount that I'm eating. And yeah, it, it's, so, I mean, Erin would know this. She's like the world's most amazing gluten-free baker. One of my inspirations for sure. Um, it's really difficult to cut everything out of a baking recipe and it still be amazing. And I know, I know there are people that have, you know, you look online and you can come across gluten-free vegan cakes galore, but of all my experiments of trying them, they just aren't that nice. Yeah. Um, that is really, really, really hard to get that, the lightness in a cake when there's no gluten and no eggs. Yeah. So yeah, it, you know something, I I'm, noticed, something I'm definitely trialing. I noticed that you've got psyllium in one of your cakes. Have you uh, what you do, don't you, in the quinoa chocolate cake? No. Maybe it's another one of your I think cakes. it's in the baking, it's in the um cookies. Mm. Oh right. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. The buckwheat chocolate or something. Um yeah. so also oh, that's not a cake, is it? I guess a cookie mm. you find easier it is cookies, I, I cookies are easy. so challenging mind you my cookies um, have eggs in them too <laughs> right right so have you ever done it without i'm just curious like just to answer that like if you want to move away from eggs i mean obviously there's flax and chia but psyllium is something yeah. that's a bit more gel yeah um yeah well i've actually the last few months i've been that's i've been craving cake and i haven't been really eating eggs so i have done quite a few trials I've they've still been edible, but it's not a they're not recipes I would publish anywhere because they weren't overly enjoyable. So work in progress on that one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we'll we'll check back in on that one. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Um, Erin also asks. Uh, she says we're about to enter fall in these layers. What did you cook this last winter the most that you are sick of? So we can start cooking that now. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> Oh my God. Hard question, Erin, actually, because honestly, my diet has been so simple since I finished working on this book um, that I don't think anyone would be inspired by the food that I've been eating lately. Um, what about this? And, <laughs> that would be nice. This yep, is yep. something that I, I meant to go into that, like what I've, what I've bookmarked, but that looks so good, that squat, because we're about to move into fall, like as she said, so I thought. Yeah. That's kind of like something that totally yeah, inspiring. Um, There's also a curry in here. I don't know if you um, the weeknight curry. Yes, yes, yeah. exactly that one. Look yeah. at that. <laughs> Snap. That yeah, so that curry is delicious. And um, yeah, so I don't know if we mentioned it, but like dotted throughout this book, I've I give like the base kind of recipe, and then a couple of different ideas for different um you know ways that you can take the recipe which is hilarious actually I've got to mention this I remember when your second book came out and it was when I was maybe halfway through writing mine and I opened up your book and I was like oh I hope she doesn't think that I'm copying her because <laughs> we both had the same idea of 
kind of presenting recipes in the way that chefs cook you know you have a base recipe and then you just go from there rather than having five different recipes for kind of the same thing yeah so dotted throughout this book there's lots of base recipes and then you can just make them your own with whatever vegetables or fruit you've got um, at hand yeah so that weeknight curry is a good one because it literally just says um four to six cups of your favorite vegetables mm, whatever you perfect. have at hand yeah great yeah, yeah. i love that that's what we and Aaron will be cooking starting soon. Um, Sarah asks, what does Emma grow in her garden? Does her family help her with it? And uh, does Emma can or preserve any of the bounty? Uh, we grow all sorts. So we're just into spring. So it's kind of the in-between season at the moment where we're just almost ready to pull out everything and then plant our summer garden. But at the moment we're growing... Um, well, maybe I should talk, should I, where, where do you think most of the people are, are tuning in from? Should I say what we had, what we planted in fall? Maybe I think it's a be... good mix. It looks like Australia and yeah. US. So oh, yeah, yeah. go ahead and tell yeah. us what you're, yeah. you know. So can... at the moment we're actually eating, it'll actually it'll cross over. At the moment we're yeah. eating all the things that we planted in autumn, which is what you guys call fall. Um, but we should so, be planting now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So lots of lots of greens, like I mentioned, kale, silver beet, uh, carrots, beetroot, parsnips are nearly ready. Uh, lots of herbs. I've got heaps of coriander, which is what you guys call cilantro, mm -hmm. I think. Um, I've got onions. I can't remember if I said that. I'm just about to start planting potatoes here. Mm. um and kumara which is what you guys would call sweet potatoes i believe oh yeah um so i mean we we i'm one of those people because i'm so into food i try to grow a little bit of everything and especially yeah. the kind of weird and wonderful things that you can't necessarily just buy in a store or farmer's market so i grow yeah all sorts and Other. does my family help um my husband yes my children <laughs> no <laughs> <laughs> and do I preserve or can things I do I do a lot of yeah. um, preserving so I have jars still actually it gets to this time of the year when I'm like oh my god we kind of need to start eating all these things. yeah <laughs> so heaps of um tomatoes and different relishes and chutneys and um different fruits that I preserve yeah yeah for sure wonderful well, you kind of have touched on this a little bit throughout the conversation, but um, Sherry asks, what are you cooking with all your garden greens right now? So what are some of the other <laughs> things you're doing with the plethora of greens? No, you've mentioned a few, but. Yeah, yeah. So actually, yeah, at the moment I'm eating really simply, um, but what I will be getting into soon, and it's um, something that I shared in this book as well, is preserving the greens so that you can use them later on um, rather than them going to waste you know because at the end of the season everything shoots up and it tries to go to seed and then you know you can't eat it because it gets kind of quite tough so before then I harvest as much as I can and I either dehydrate it like I explained before and crush it up if that's like kale is really good for that but other greens like chard um what you can do is you can blanch them. So just cook them in a pot of boiling water just for like 20 seconds, just till they're wilted and then squeeze out all the liquid. And then I actually push them into like an ice cube tray or one of those silicon, little, little, little silicon molds. And then I freeze them and then they are ready to like, once they're frozen, you can pop them out and stick them in a Ziploc bag and keep them in your freezer and then it's really easy for later on just to um, either defrost some and add it to like a quiche or a curry or a um, whatever but they're also really good in summer to add to smoothies as well um, so the little you know you can just add them frozen to smoothies and it's a really nice way to one not waste the greens and you can you know if you don't have a garden you can do this with say if you buy a massive big bunch of chard from the supermarket or the farmer's market and you aren't kind of going to get through it fast enough before yeah. it starts to go yuck just blanch it freeze it and then you can use it later on yeah love that um yeah. yeah sarah asks what are some of your favorite foods my favorite foods i really like 
I've already said this and it sounds really boring. I really like rice. <laughs> <laughs> I love chocolate, dark chocolate, yeah. um, borderline obsession, probably not so great, but um, love chocolate. <laughs> um, I'm really, and Aaron will get this one as well because I feel we connect on, on this level. I'm a, I'm a baker at heart. So yeah. when I was working as a chef, I predominantly worked in the pastry section and um, baking is something that gives me so much joy like not even necessarily the eating side of it but actually just the making you know actually making baking okay. cakes or making a batch of muffins um I really enjoy the process yeah there and are also, yeah. oh sorry go ahead I was just gonna say probably my favorite foods also are curries <laughs> as you yeah. can see from my books I always share lots of curry recipes and also my mother-in-law's um bun sal the Vietnamese crispy pancakes is probably mm -hmm. like uh, one of my favorite things on earth to eat. Yeah. I am a big chocolate lover myself and I was definitely <laughs> noticing a number of wonderful looking dark, kind of dark chocolate recipes in your book, including Amy, you mentioned the chocolate quinoa cake looks yeah. incredible. And then, um, these banana and dark chocolate muffins as well. So, and the pear but, dark chocolate. Cookie. Yes. <laughs> that was the other one. Okay. I knew there was one more. When I got to that page in the book, that photo is just so stunning. I was like, yeah, oh, I've marked it if anyone wants to see. Oh, yeah. It does yeah. look really beautiful. Oh my gosh. It looks so good. Because often a healthy ish clafuti just doesn't look that good. But, <laughs> that um, one looks gorgeous. Put yeah, some pears and chocolate eggs. on it. You have the eggs. <laughs> I have a question I'm just curious about. I noticed that you have mostly like cooked vegetables and not so much on the raw vegetables. Mm -hmm. Is that just kind of personal preference or is it that's just how you tend to cook or is that also partially like for health reasons? A little bit of all of that actually. I actually got to the end of writing this book and I was like wow I don't really have salads in here and um I'm a real like salads is kind of my thing like curries salads and and cakes <laughs> I would <Yeah>. say is <laughs> is kind of you know my favorite foods and I would kind of surprise myself that I didn't have mm -hmm. heaps of salads in here but maybe maybe I don't know maybe that it wasn't needed for this book yeah. but I do for health reasons I do tend to eat most mostly cooked um mm -hmm. I have yeah. cravings for raw salads and I definitely eat them but I don't eat in large amounts because my gut health isn't so great so yeah yeah what is a go-to like salad that you that you do like to do um one of my favorite ones actually and I am a little bit bad for saying this because it's not in this book it's in my second <laughs> book actually <laughs> um and it's right, um, perfect timing for in the US is a persimmon and um, mm. kumara or sweet potato salad. Oh, yeah. One of my favorites. It's got spices in there. It was inspired by a recipe from a friend of mine, Bryant Terry from the States. Um, he had a recipe for baked sweet potato and then he made like this persimmon salsa, I think, on the top of it. Mm. And that was like, I made it and it, the flavors were so amazing. And I was like, I need to, I need to use these flavors. And so I changed it up into that a is. salad and it's got like, yeah, it's got spices. It's oh, got that sounds amazing. Um, pickled jalapeno. Oh, is in that it. it? Oh, wow. Is that it? That's it. It looks like yeah. it. Oh, thanks, Amy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. I'll have to go find that <laughs> yeah, one. It does too. sound really good. <laughs> yeah. It sounds amazing. Um, yeah. Just a couple more quick questions and then we'll wrap up. another them. good salad. Ooh. Like, yeah, I feel like there were lots of salads actually in that second book. Yeah, this is the second book. Is that I'm just going to have a... Uh, it's actually out of print, so no, but... Um, no, so forget that. <laughs> have to go to your forget, I'm, I'm trying to find one in the new book that you can actually get your hands on. Um, but I, <laughs> I feel like there weren't... I didn't, yeah, I didn't do many in this. I was kind of... For this book, I wanted um, more like meals. Yeah. And I know salads can be meals for sure, but um, I wanted more meals. So there's actually three different chapters for dinners, um, for yeah. meals in this book. Yeah. So like the really super fast ones, the kind of weeknight, can't remember what the chapter titles are, weeknight easy. And then yeah. there's a chapter for kind of plan ahead meals so that while they may be a little bit um, more involved, there you go. Yeah, there's um, the carrot salad bowls yeah yeah, yeah. oh 
I forgot about you. That's that's a good yeah, one. I have that one marked too, because that just looks like I love grated carrot. I think it's yeah. just the most underrated thing ever. I mean, totally. hippies did it all the time on sandwiches. We grew up <laughs> eating rye bread with grated carrot, avocado. Oh my god! It's yeah, a bit of mayonnaise. That's just the best sandwich. I love it. Totally. And so that salad, I've presented it like with all sorts of different things but actually the main flavor in the guts of it is just the carrot salad which you can totally yeah. make yourself and the main flavorings in that are literally sesame seeds chopped coriander which is cilantro and yeah. um sesame oil and lime and Love that. it's so simple Delicious. but yeah i could eat yeah i, I could eat that every yeah. day <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay yeah. let's see uh sarah asks what to what extent does your family eat uh gluten-free and dairy-free right uh so my husband eats everything he's okay mm -hmm. with everything um he also eats meat um mm -hmm. my son is a teenager so he doesn't listen to me i feel like he probably <laughs> shouldn't eat as much gluten and dairy as he does but he does his own thing um and my daughter eats gluten-free so it's just me and my daughter that okay. eat gluten-free she gotcha. eats a tiny bit of dairy but not much we yeah we're kind of the same in that sense a little bit of dairy but not much gotcha. yeah gotcha well i have one more question that's kind of a silly question i hope you don't <laughs> mind from an anonymous attendee who noticed your uh tattoos on your hands i'm oh. curious about those <laughs> can you see them yeah. yeah so i just got these done uh, about this time last year actually just after okay. my book came out oh wow um and oh, i mean th th there is a big meaning behind it and, and why i got it but the the very shortened version is <laughs> um they just kind of represent strength really yeah. so these are oh, traditional these are like well then they are a traditional the way that they were done was in the traditional manner that um is practiced in lots of parts of the world but here in new zealand um maori which um i have in in me i don't know how to say, mm -hmm. how to say that yeah. in I'm, I'm part maori and part mm -hmm. european and mm -hmm. um the traditional way of doing tattoos here is um i don't i don't know the word for it but you know like with, it's like a, just a tiny little kind of chisel and yeah. they dip it in the ink and then it, they kind of tap it like this Oh, okay. And so these these were done in that wow. way, um, wow. and it was a really beautiful process. There was a beautiful man called Moko that lives in Auckland. I travelled up there, told him why I wanted it and yeah. roughly what I want, like where I wanted it, and then yeah. he listened to me and he he designed it. And um, yeah, they actually they represent teeth. Um, mm. Yeah. that so it does come back around <laughs> yeah yeah and i think it was really quite um symbolic to have my hands tattooed because yeah. they are such a big part of you know i mean for most people you, you for everyone you use your hands a lot but you know everything that yeah. i do gardening cooking everything yeah. is with my hands Beautiful. Well, thank you for sharing that with us, even though it's a little bit off topic, <laughs> but thanks for being a good sport and huge thank you to both of you for joining us today. And Emma, congratulations again on the beautiful new book. Um, yeah, thank you so much for being here. And thank you so much for everyone that tuned in. Uh, the replay will be up on YouTube in the next couple of days. Uh, so we will see you all there. Thank you. Thanks for Thank having you us. so much. It was Thank a lot of so fun. Much. Happy birthday. Oh, yes. And Thank happy you. birthday, Emma. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye.